Good morning, everyone. Hello. Welcome to this, uh, to this webinar. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Antoine Bogini, managing partner at PHB on Partners, a corporate finance and valuation advisory firm, board member of uh, LVPA, an affiliated member uh, of the LPEA. And I'm uh, really pleased to be here today on this uh, co-organized uh, webinar, co-organized by the LPEA, Luxembourg Private Equity Association, and the LVPA, Luxembourg Valuation Professional Association. And um, the, the LVPA is an association um, whose value is to lead and represent the valuation professions here in Luxembourg. We have already more than uh, 100 uh, individual members and, and 30 institutional members. And today, you, you got it, we will discuss about valuation and in particular valuation challenges. It's probably more, more interesting. We are the, the 6th of, uh, of March. Uh, so maybe for some of you, you are already done with your financial reporting for uh, year end 23. Maybe some of you, you are still in the middle of it. Uh, and we thought that maybe that's the right timing to take stock. Uh, and to discuss, to exchange on the valuation challenges that you encountered or maybe you are still facing. And to do that today, I'm, I'm not uh, the only one here. Uh, I'm uh, pleased and uh, honored to moderate that, uh, that panel with uh, five valuation experts. And maybe the, the first one, uh, Elena, your uh, managing director in the portfolio valuation practice of uh, Kroll's uh, alternative asset advisory unit based in Luxembourg. Uh, over 10 years of experience in valuation across Europe. Uh, you're also a member of the business valuation board of the IVSC, so for the International Valuation Standard Council, and an elected board member of the LVPA. Good morning, Elena. Uh, and then close to you, Irina. So, Irina, you're a partner at uh, Mazar Luxembourg when you lead the, the valuation practice. More than 15 years in experience in, uh, in valuation. You're also an elected board member of the LVPA and you co-lead the technical working group. Hello, Irina. Uh, Christophe, Christophe, you're uh, a partner at EY Luxembourg when you lead the, the strategy and transactions department. Uh, over 25 years experience in M&A and valuation. You have worked in senior management roles in the banking industry and also with a big four firm. Uh, elected board member and your president of uh, the LVPA, also member of the LPEA Markets and uh, Operations Committee. So you're the chairman of the uh, LVPA. So good morning, chairman. Thank you and good morning, everyone. <laughs> Daniele, on your side, so corporate finance partner in the deal advisory department at KPMG Luxembourg. Uh, more than 15 years of uh, experience in uh, valuation across industries and, and uh, geographies, valuing assets for M&A, financial reporting and tax purposes as well. And you're also a funding member of the LVPA. So hello, Daniele. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, Raffaele, on, on your side, so Corporate Finance Director at PwC Luxembourg, where we are today. Uh, you lead the Valuation and Modeling Advisory Team, uh, 15 years of experience in, in valuation around the world, and you previously held a position as Conducting Officer in charge of valuation of Partners Group, also an AIFM, elected board member uh, of the LVPA, uh, co-lead the Technical Working Group with Irina, and you're also a Chapter Executive at Kaya. Bonjour, Raphaël. Uh, bonjour, Raphaël. He he hello, Antoine. Just to correct, it's Raphaël and not Raphaël. Indeed. But, uh, that, <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a pleasure to host, uh, to co-host this at, um, at PLUC. Thank you. So maybe how should we uh, structure this, uh, this exchange? So what we decided to do is maybe to uh, categorize the valuation challenges we will go through in three sections. So the, the first one will be regulation and valuation standards because there were some uh, movements uh, on this side over the past uh, 12 months. Section two, impact of market conditions on valuations. Uh, interestingly, also uh, some uh, uh, movements on that side. And uh, last section, section three, evolution of valuation practices. We have one hour to do that, uh, and maybe we will, uh, we will keep some uh, uh, extra minutes afterwards 
also on your side of your screen if you have some questions uh, to ask feel free to put this question in the uh, in the chat in the in the q a so that we can go through them at the end of the session if our panelists if you still have a bit of, of energy after one hour we will go through this question so yeah if you have some question don't be shy ask them at the right moment great great panel great panelists uh, so uh, we will we will go through them now that the stage is uh, is properly set maybe let's uh, go for the first section so regulation and valuation standards uh, because actually these standards are also the, the backbone of valuation practices but they are evolving uh, and maybe we can we can see that on the on the first slide we, we prepared this uh, this slide here to illustrate uh, how they 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 have moved uh, and maybe the first one is about the IPEF guidelines updated in December 22 uh, I remember that we, we already discussed about that uh, last year. Um, there were also the revised uh, IVS, so International Valuation Standards, uh, published uh, in January 24. Um, so that's also in terms of valuation standard, but also regulatory frameworks are evolving. There was this uh, ESMA, uh, so for the European Securities and, and Market Authority, CSA, Common Supervisory Action on Valuation. It has been released uh, on the 24th of May, 23. And after that, a couple of months later, uh, the regulator, the CSSF here in Luxembourg, uh, published its uh, feedback report in, in July, so also with, uh, with guidances. Okay, that, that's quite a lot uh, for, let's say, in, in, uh, in 12 months. Um, so maybe my, my first question is, uh, is to you, Irina. Uh, uh, there, there was this, this discussion so uh, last year about the impact of the IPEF guidelines on the valuation practices. So we are one year later. In practice, what, what do you see? Any anything? Any change on that? Yes, thank you for the question. Actually, the uh, from practical perspective, we see that the standards got really more practical. I would say, and as practitioners, we do appreciate that a lot. Uh, because, of course, they leave still some room for interpretation and imagination, I would say. But still, um, in very many ways, they are more concrete and detailed when it comes to very important topics in our work, which really uh, simplifies our life, let's say, especially when it comes to discussing uh, how the evaluation should be done with clients and auditors. Uh, so, um, as an example, for example, focus on the market, of course, like we always have been focusing on the market, but um, pro probably recently uh, there were some um, uh, questions raised about if we can rely on the dislocated, stressed, volatile markets or not. And actually, uh, IPF says, yes, we can, but the analysis is needed and the analysis is the key here. So we can't just rely on some uh, market data without any further thought given to that. And actually, um, this is what I like about the new IPF standards is that it's uh, more substance over form, I would say. Also, they place a lot of emphasis on uh, VC uh, evaluation. Uh, really providing a detailed roadmap how you should approach the analysis, um, uh, what are the criteria of applicability of LFR last financing round, uh, what, um, what milestones we should analyze, and how we should deal with uh, complex capital structures. This was like really a gray area before, and previous standards really shied away from this topic. However, now we see uh, quite detailed guidance and even models um, provided in the standards uh, that might help us tackle this issue with complex capital allocation. Therefore, as I said, like practically speaking, we are more relaxed now. I mean, in terms of analysis, it might be more heavy. It might be heavier just because you have uh, detailed procedures. On the other hand, it's uh, more transparent and consistent in the market. Especially when it comes to like, uh, you know, those myths that you can use a three month, six month or 12 month period to keep the course, for example. Um, and now it's clear that you cannot and you need to analyze it in more detail. On the other hand, you can use some rounds after the evaluation date. 
um, if uh, the price was already known and knowable back, like as a devolution date, and it's uh, really more substance over form, I would say, which which is really good. Thank you, thank you for that. And indeed, you mentioned also a notion of uh, distress or dislocated market. This is something that we will uh, we will discuss a bit a bit later. And these standards, so uh, the, uh, the the IPF guidelines, so. We have, we have also another update on the uh, international valuation standard, and I'm more maybe uh, looking, at, looking at you, Elena, on, uh, on this one. So they have been released in, in January, so only two months ago. Uh, you are also part of the IVSC Business Valuation Board, uh, so probably the right question, uh, the right person for that question. What are the main changes? And also, I'm a bit, I'm a bit curious, what are maybe the ongoing internal discussions uh, at the Business Valuation Board? Well, <laughs> thank you, Antoine. I think uh, there are many things happening on the IVSC and the new standards. What is worthy to mention from my point of view is that prior issuing the new valuation standards, we had a consultation period. So from July last year, <clears throat> We had a period of when we are looking for the public to be involved in the new international valuation standards, meaning that different valuation professional organizations, different members of IBSC, they were providing feedback on the new proposals, which was very interactive, very dynamic, because we received feedback from all around the world, and these feedbacks were taken into account by the standard reviews board. Next, uh, for people who are not very familiar with the international valuation standards. International valuation standards is structured on general standards and asset standards. So general standards, these are valuation standards applicable for all asset classes. On the other hand, the asset standards, we group them into three main categories, meaning business valuation, meaning tangible assets, including real estate or visually, and financial instruments. And under these uh, three main groups, we have different standards. From an update perspective, what is important to mention that we have significant updates on the general standards, meaning to the standards applicable for all asset classes. The main points of attention are the IVS 104, meaning data and input, IVS 105, meaning valuation models, and IVS 106, meaning documentation and reporting. So all of these, they refer to the valuation process and governance, which is important to mention that in the current context of Luxembourg, as you mentioned about ESMA report, about the CSSF feedback to ESMA report, these are very important because they touch the valuation policy and they touch the valuation models, which IVS, the new standard, address these questions. So, I mean, from a data and input, what is important to mention that we have a ESG criteria coming new. It's actually, it's a new chapter in the IVS and we have IVS criteria and cut, making them like by categories, what are the potentials like including into the valuation. From valuation model, definitely it's important to mention that currently we have a definition for what is a valuation model, what should be the characteristics of a valuation model and how it should be applied. And Last but not least, documentation and reporting is very important because a valuation, for a valuation to be reliable, we need, it needs to be documented. And there is a full process of disclosure how valuation should be documented and in terms of reporting in order to be compliant with IVSC. So these are the main important things on the general standards. Definitely there are other standards, other updates on the asset standards as well. Uh, I also, I mean, if you allow me, I can announce that on together with the LVPA, we will have a webinar between LVPA and IVSC on 22nd of March to discuss this into more details and what is important to be known from a Luxembourg perspective. Regarding uh, the boards, yes, I think it's, uh, it's a very interesting time for evaluations as you may appreciate. And on we had uh, last week uh, of uh, IVSC business evaluation board meeting together with other boards we met in New York where we discussed different aspects of evaluation of a, like meaning the new standards and the future standards. 
So there are different topics of discussion. First one, it's visually the new standards, how they accept it, what is the feedback on them, because they were issued, as you said, in January 2024, but they will be effective as of January 2025, and early adoption is, in, is encouraged. So due to this, currently there are people coming with different feedbacks into, into the, the new standards, which were discussed among different boards. Uh, from a business evaluation perspective, board, what we the main topics are the intangible assets for sure, because I mean, due to the new adverse of the technology, I mean, intangible assets they take more and more place. The big question comes here is the discrepancy what we have currently between the book value and the fair value. So whenever you have a listed company on the stock exchange, when you look at the balance sheet, you understand that this is not relevant comparing to what is the actually market cap of a company. So this discrepancy comes to the lack in the accounting standards because we are not able to capture to fair value, I mean, to put at fair value all the intangibles. Within this group, a big question is on the data valuation, which we issued last week, a new perspective paper on the data of valuation, meaning that currently there is limited guidelines on how to value the data. And as you know, like whenever we are doing a PPA data, it's never as a separate asset class. And it should be the case because it's taking more place into our, uh, into the, I mean, the businesses and so on. Another point of discussion was also, I mean, uh, due to the volatility in the market, we also had a big discrepancy, in, I mean, specifically for the funds which are publicly listed, for example, in the real estate, the rates were publicly listed. I mean, we, we observed a decrease in the valuation, perhaps not a decrease at the level of a net asset value. This is also a topic of discussion within the tangible asset board. And it, I mean, there are different organizations taking a new perspective into it. Is it the private market are more robust or we have a lack into the valuation? There are <clears throat> Other topics like interesting topics like the terminal value into evaluation. Is it reliable to assume that the business goes into perpetuity? Should we change this Gordon Grove assumptions, which is, uh, which is currently very interesting. So there are many things happening on the business valuation board and uh, definitely many way can be applicable into the local framework of Luxembourg. Thank you, thank you for this uh, insight on, on my side. So I took note of, uh, of the date. So you mentioned the 22nd of, of March for this uh, webinar between LVPA and IVSC. So, so on your side, if you want to know more, maybe you can register to that, to that webinar. And, uh, and it seems that actually we, we have a trend here because you mentioned uh, so valuation models, you mentioned data and input, and you mentioned documentation. Uh, and it's for so international valuation standards, but this is also something that we see maybe closer to us, maybe at the European level, because also these terms, these notions have been mentioned by the uh, ESMA in their common supervisory action, uh, and by the CSSF also in their uh, feedback reports. Um, the CSSF feedback reports have been released now more than six months ago. There was also this date uh, implementation date by the 31st of December. Um, so maybe here I, I have a question for, for you, Christophe. How are AIFMs and MANCOs, because it's not only directed to AIFM, but MANCOs as well, how are they reacting to these reports, ESMA and TSSF ones? Yes, and, and uh, very good to have uh, recapped a little bit the days because it was a short timeline, uh, basically. Uh, so uh, uh, the, um, the ESMA, and, and I think, uh, Participants also see it on screen. So in the course of 2023, uh, we had first the ESMA report and then uh, with the findings and then the CSSF report with uh, the recommendations uh, to those findings. Um, and uh, all of that uh, had been issued over summer more or less and by year end it needed to be implemented. So I think, um, uh, well, well as an as as an LVPA uh, organization, we obviously um, uh, wanted to raise the awareness uh, on those topics. We organized uh, different events, uh, notably um, uh, our annual event where we invited the CSSF to to present a little bit. 
Thereafter, also roundtables uh, to have an open discussions between AFMs and MANCOs on these topics. And indeed, there were a lot of questions, um, not uh, per se on whether it was uh, fundamentally uh, something uh, which uh, uh, which was surprising, because um, uh, I think uh, most of the points that are in those um, uh, recommendations make sense. Now, uh, the, the devil is often in the detail, uh, the definitions, uh, also going a little bit back, what needs to be uh, documented, uh, we, we talked uh, about it just before. Um, so these are uh, these are all uh, things that have been uh, debated amongst market participants between AFMs, Mancos. Also, the perimeter of uh, of uh, uh, of this um, of this uh, recommendations, because um, there was a little bit some uh, some hesitation. Does it uh, apply to all or not? And especially uh, because the initial survey was done on the basis of. Um, uh targeting mostly uh usage with less liquid uh, or yeah uh usage with less liquid uh, assets and also the open ended funds uh so the question was does this apply as well to closed ended uh, funds the the answer is uh, clearly yes um and uh, yeah with that i think um uh many of the market participants did react uh, i i think myself but also my uh, my fellow panelists here uh, have been uh, relatively active in updating valuation policies, model reviews, and 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 what else do I know? Um, but I think uh, it was interesting also, uh, although many AFMs and Mancos did react, it was also interesting to have uh, our uh, event uh, follow up event in February uh, with the LVPA where we uh, saw still some important questions which are which were being uh, raised challenged views and so forth so i think it's not over yet uh, so to say uh, but uh, that uh, also we will learn by doing uh, uh, as a as a profession as a as a as a marketplace uh, but uh, yeah i'm i'm comfortable that uh, all of these points do make sense go into the right direction and yes there will be a little bit more uh, formalism documentation that needs to be done, but I think uh, that is not abnormal in uh, given the the times we know. I, I agree that uh, indeed it was a very let's say short or compressed time frame also to implement everything, and maybe things are still let's say ongoing in terms of documentation, also questions at the uh, AIFM and, and Manco level. Um, maybe Daniele, on your side, you have maybe the same the same. Uh, views on it, or do you see it slightly differently? Uh, well, let's say uh, what we see on the market, of course, uh, also after this publication, which were clarifying points that were already known, I would say, to the valuation professionals, uh, is uh, clearly a growing attention on the valuation process overall. So let's say not only jumping into data, preparing models, but also structuring the entire valuation stream, starting, and I think this is very important, from a very well-structured valuation framework. So what we see is many clients are asking us, uh, can you review our valuation policy? Can you review our valuation framework? Because one of the points which was, let's say, flagged was basically that uh, in many cases, the valuation policies were not updated. In many cases, the valuation policies were not already considering changes in the market conditions. So we, we, we've been talking about stressed market situations for more than three years now. It's basically our new normal, but, uh, Evaluation policy should also, for example, consider what if the company I'm valuing uh, is delisted? How it's the valuation, let's say, bridged from one valuation date to the second one? Or what if the company I'm valuing is facing uh, uh, a liquidity, let's say, uh, concern or let's say a situation where there is a loss of uh, an important stream of revenue? So I think this is very this is very important and gives uh, a lot of continuity to the evaluation process, um, a lot of consistency as well, uh, especially in in this situation. So that's a good uh, that's a good occasion to update uh, and improve 
devaluation process. There were also a couple of additional points, which in my opinion were pretty, pretty important. Again, you know, the reiteration of how important is evaluation in the stressed market condition. Um, some additional remarks on, uh, for example, the, 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 the independence of the valuation function, which is also interesting. And also a point which, in my opinion, is very important uh, in relation to how, when you externalize your valuation, you should still challenge the valuation, especially when you are facing with open-ended funds. Um, so I think it's really a good reminder and it's again focusing the attention on, let's say, the overall quality and importance of the valuation. Okay, thank thank yeah. you, Daniele. I, I agree. And uh, uh, also one point that I'm noting is that when we talk about valuation and based on the points you raised, that actually it's not always about figures or exactly. quantitative, exactly. quantitative data. Here you mentioned valuation policy and procedures independence, governance, and here's not about how much, it's about how the valuation function is set up. And I think it's also, let's say, a key point also to, to focus on and on which the, the regulators are also uh, looking at. Yeah, so thank, thank you for that. Uh, maybe on, on your side, Raphael, because you uh, also, you were also uh, a, a conducting officer in an AIFM. Maybe how do you, do you see that? Uh, maybe also in more practical terms, uh, any impact on that uh, valuation function? C certainly, uh, Antoine. So I, I think that there are several points that are very important about the CSSF feedback report. Um, in, in practice, I think that uh, there is clarification uh, regarding some points. There, are, there is clarification regarding exactly, uh, I mean, how to, whether that, that there is more need to, to explain thoroughly the valuation process in the valuation policies. Um, I think that a point where there is a there has been a lot of discussion, and we see the, that the regulators are 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 more keen to, to 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 hear what the market has to say is related to valuation models, to how the valuation models are incorporated in the valuation process, how are they explained, how we're mitigating the spreadsheet risk that can come from these models, um, and we 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 evidence that there is not necessarily a consensus uh, between within the industry on what uh, is a, a valuation model is. Uh, certainly, the, the, the definition by IVSC of valuation model is, is welcome. Uh, it's not necessarily the one that, 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 that that's being applied at the moment by, by all market participants. And I'm not sure either that should be the one that should be applied. That's, uh, that's open for discussion. Um, we, we see that there, certainly this particular paragraph, which is Article 68 of the Delegated Regulation, um, we have been we have been received, receiving a lot of questions from clients uh, in the same manner that my, my colleagues here. I think that we have um, received many questions from clients. We have uh, supported clients in reviewing the evaluation framework during the past uh, during the last six months of, of last year, um, which was a very interesting process in, ter in terms of gaining uh, a view of go the governance. And uh, another point that we see we see coming uh, very often were the points related to stress market conditions, uh, how stress market conditions should be interpreted exhaustively or not within the valuation policies, and how the valuation should reflect these changes in the markets. So uh, as we really very well know, private markets and public markets valuation may be a bit decorrelated. However, I think that this, um, it's uh, the, the willingness of the ESMA is the objective of the ESMA to, 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 to a further extent that uh, there is an incorporation of these market events within the private markets valuation, um, <clears throat> which is very curious when you compare it to IPEF, where they, the question is more, oh, should we consider these located markets? And ESMA on the other side pushing you to go to, towards, uh, towards incorporating it. Uh, this particular element, um, we have seen it, uh, we have seen, we have received many questions regarding fund of funds, uh, how fund of funds can incorporate should incorporate these stress market conditions and these movements within the evaluation process. So fund of fund players, normally they will have a lag because uh, between the moment the, the GP is reporting the valuation to the LP, uh, you can have up to three months before receiving the valuation, two months and a half or maybe. Um, and that means that uh, you very often for Q4, you will be dealing with Q3 data in your reporting at the end of December. Um, the question, how you, should you, should you incorporate the new information that's getting in? And particularly if you have large movements, 
Okay, and that, that's that's where that's where we have seen that different players. Uh, so there are several ways to incorporate this, but the, the guidance that ESMA and CSF are providing now, I think it's it's very beneficial in terms of uh, um, mitigating this time lapse that you have in valuation. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, and uh, and indeed, so we we saw that a lot of changes also on this regulatory framework. So we mentioned uh, uh, ESMA, we mentioned the the CSSF. Uh, similar noises also from the the SEC in the in the US, the FCA also in the UK. So it's not only at European level. Uh, at, and at at the same point in time, there are also uh, rapid changes also on on market conditions. Uh, so it's on top of that. Uh, just to uh, list a few: um, inflation, uh, interest rates changes in, in monetary policies, less liquidity in the financial system, generally speaking, uh, geopolitical risk, uh, distressed markets, dislocated markets, you mentioned that. And of course, these uh, inputs should be should have an impact on, on the asset valuations. Uh, and maybe I'm just taking taking one, for instance, inflation and interest rates. I think that we, we prepared also a slide, a second slide, uh, showing that the um, interest interest rates are, are going up, maybe they are stabilizing a bit uh, over the past uh, few months. Uh, and, and maybe here a question for, for you, Daniele, because inflation interest rates, they are of course critical inputs for, for valuation. Most business plans include inflation, risk-free rates, it's a key input for the discount rate. Uh, and if we have also to consider uh, long-term growth rates, there's also an impact in, on that. So if we have more uncertainties on this input, how can, can it be considered, let's say, for a valuation practitioner? Well, let's say that uh, over the last three years, uh, we, let's say, we, we, we were performing valuation under a significant amount of uh, uncertainty. So we are a little bit used to this uh, new normal when it comes to the valuation uh, scenarios and, and parameters. Um, in, in following, I would say, the, the, the conflict, we have observed an increase in, uh, in, uh, in interest rate, uh, an increase in inflation, uh, which would, let's say, theoretically uh, lead to, let's say, a shrinking value, so a decrease uh, um, because the economy should, in theory, react uh, in order to lower inflation with, you know, uh, a, a decrease. But this, I don't think, could be applied to cool, so different, uh, different sectors reacted differently to, let's say, the evolution of these uh, evaluation parameters following, uh, let's say, the quantitative ease, uh, easing, which actually we were getting too much used to. So now we, we have seen the, uh, the effects. Um, different sector reacted differently. Infrastructure, for example, which is considered more or less a safe haven, has uh, performed better with values which have uh, uh, been only partially impacted. On the other side, uh, real estate, especially real estate developments, were, of course, more, more impacted. Um, from a valuation perspective, uh, I usually like to focus on two different topics. On one side, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's crucial that uh, we, we, we consider the consistency between uh, the inflation, which is reflected in the discount rate on one side, uh, and also the expected inflation in the business plan. So this is uh, um, key because, of course, uh, if there is a higher uh, degree of inflation in our cash flow, this should be counterbalanced by the discount rate. Um, especially if we are valuing assets, uh, I'm thinking about Poland, where, for example, inflation levels are even, even, even higher. So there should be, let's say, an appropriate calibration between the discount rate and the cash flow. Um, but I think uh, what is also very important is to consider the going concern of the company. You know? Many times we perform our valuation, we look at the cash flow pre-debt repayment, uh, we discount the cash flow, but we really do not pose a lot of attention on the, 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 the payback capability. So is this company really capable of paying back uh, their liabilities uh, uh, over the next 12 months? How is the company supposed to perform? Um, and I think this is very important because uh, 
if uh, on one side inflation impacts revenues and costs, and then there could be a discussion on how much inflation you can pass to our customer, to, to your customer. Um, it's, it's also important to understand uh, that uh, debt, so especially for developments, uh, is something that needs to be repaid. And when the profitability is not enough, uh, clearly also the, the selection of the valuation methodology could be, could be impacted. So I think those are points where uh, the, the, the value should should really uh, focus rather than just checking, you know, was the inflation reflected in the in the in the risk free rates? Yes, uh, there are indeed key uh, key points to uh, to flag. Uh, and even if when we talk about interest rates or inflation, okay, no one has a, a crystal ball. However, we need to make sure that there's some consistency in the model. So if the, an assumption is taken yeah. for the discount rate, it would be the same also in the business plan when you estimate the cash flows including also for the long long term. Um, and maybe rebounding all on interest rates, and maybe here, uh, that, that's uh, maybe a, a more technical question for, for you, Raphael. Uh, when we talk about interest rates, uh, risk-free rates, it's also, it also relates to uh, equity risk premium, uh, because these two notions are generally interrelated when we want also to assess a discount rate in, in the income approach. How, how do you see that? Because of course it could have an impact and also for strategies with, with a long-term view such as infrastructure. So inter risk free rates and equity risk premium. Very interesting question indeed, uh, Antoine. So uh, I think that the first element that we need to put in, in context is that um, w when we're studying uh, discount rates, you don't see discount rates running wild in the nature. What do I mean with this? It's, it's, it's very difficult to, 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 to see the, the, the discount rate that has been estimated by another party unless you, have, you obtain the same, the, the full calculation. And because in order to have a discount rate, you need cash flows and you need a price that needs, that, that's being paid. Um, this leads us to the challenge that we need to, we normally use models to estimate the discount rate. One of them is a CIPM model, um, which helps to compose the, the, the WAC and that uh, it has obviously uh, so, uh, several uh, theoretical shortcomings and practical shortcomings. Um, these, for this, in order to get to a WAC uh, to, uh, by using the CPM, we use the equity risk premium and we use the risk-free rate. Okay? Um, what, we see, what we see often is uh, some practitioners taking shortcuts in terms of estimating certain of these parameters. And one source that's very commonly cited, for example, is Professor Damodaran. Okay, Professor Damodaran uh, used an implied ERP model, which is one of the three methodologies that you can use. Okay, so four methodologies. You can use historical uh, ERP, basically it sees the history. Uh, normally it's not very representative because you have time structural time breaks. Uh, then you can use the present, okay, because it's the, the present to see, I mean, what's the more in terms of surveys, what others are using. So the problem is that this is not live. You might normally have good service once per year, the, one, the, the survey of Professor Paulo Fernandez, for example. And then you have implied models that take the, price, the index prices, the forecasted dividends to estimate, to estimate the ERP. Okay. Normally what the Professor Damodaran is doing is using the S&P 500 to est estimate it, estimating dividends of the S&P 500 and see what's the implied ERP that you can obtain from this. Um, if you, the, the ERP that was used by Professor Damodar, that's used by Professor Damodaran, one of the indicators that he's using dropped below 4.5% for the US, which for our, our, us practitioners, that's something that comes a bit surprising because this is not necessarily what we see in the market being used otherwise. Okay, so blindly taking what someone is publishing and not contesting what by other measures can be, can be a bit uh, misleading in terms of your valuation. One of the reasons the ERP of, of Professor Damodara is so low is because you have a very heavy concentration in the S&P 500 in seven companies that compose around 40% of the index. Okay, so that 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 means that you can have significant difference that you have in, in terms of ERP in you in the U.S. at the moment. And if you do the same exercise for Europe and you see, for example, I don't know, Rabel and Partners that's that's estimated their UNAP, uh, Fenebris in the in in, in Germany, Fairness Finance, are, as well as many of the big fours are estimating in terms of, of, of ERP, you have measures that are much higher, that are around 5.5 to 6, even 6.5, or even more sometimes. So I think that it, it, the message here is, let's take the ERP estimate that you, you're using with a pinch of salt. 
um, and and this this will all, uh, enable you to come closer to what you see that other practitioners are doing and what the market is, is doing too. Well, that, that's indeed a fair point. So should we consider also, let's say, a spot a current view on this on this uh, ERP, or should we have maybe a more historical view or smooth smoother view on it? Uh, because yeah, on, environment as we said is is changing, and also when we talk about uh, higher interest rates um, and also this uh, change in the, in the mon monetary policies, uh, quantitative tightening. Uh, it results also in, in uh, less liquidity, generally speaking, and also for, for liquid assets. Uh, and and uh, so these liquid assets can become less liquid or even illiquid. And this is also something that the, the regulator spotted, uh, ESMA and, and CSSF. I'm reading here uh, an extract from the CSSF feedback report saying that the results of the liquidity stress testing shall always be taken into account when considering the valuation of less liquid assets. So I think that the question how we should categorize an asset, liquid, less liquid, or illiquid, uh, is more and more important, and also which valuation methodology we should implement depending on the liquidity of that, of that asset. Maybe, Elena, on your side, how do you, do you see that? Any, let's say, Free, more frequent change in, let's say, the, the categorization of the asset in terms of liquid, less liquid, or illiquid, and their impact on the valuation methodologies. Yeah, sure. Well, as we all know, like liquidity is becoming a big topic when we have like this type of uh, like environment with high interest rates, with high inflations, and stressed markets, right? Like just to start with a beginning, I think there was um, there was something which was not, I mean, heavily discussed in the market. But in July 2020, ESMA issued a guide called like uh, liquidity stress testing guide, and this guide was practically provided to the market in order to how to do an appropriate liquidity stress testing. And what happened is like, this was mainly due to the COVID period, right? Because they were considering that COVID will be all, I mean, it's a pandemic event and will still create a lot of stressed conditions in the market. This did not happen in Bayan because I mean, governments were, they were injecting a lot of cash in, uh, in uh, the economy. And, but, but I mean, in a nutshell, this guide talks about that liquidity stress testing should be done regularly. They recommend to do it quarterly or at least annually and for stressed markets like as I mean as often as is necessary, especially when the asset is located there and the asset also has some issues. Now when <clears throat> ESMA run this uh, <clears throat> I mean, the value, I mean, they issued, uh, they run the surveys on, with the national competent authorities uh, in across European Union and they issued the report. They, I mean, one of the point of attention was the stress market condition, right? And due to the stress market condition, they bring the liquidity stress testing again to the, uh, to the public opinion in order to make sure that people are doing it. So what they observed, one is most of the funds, they do liquidity stress testing, right? It's not something that is like completely ignored, but what happens this liquidity, the result of a liquidity stress testing is not applied into the valuation commonly. So this is something which is an ignorance and we should take into account the result of a liquidity stress testing into the valuation. So how does it happen assuming that you have an asset which is located in a stressed uh, market condition? Meaning if you have additional liquidation cost, this should take and be into account into the valuation because this means that by default mechanics, there will be a decrease in your value at the end. Also, I mean, there is one point of the liquidity on the asset level, but also there is a question about the liquidity at the fund level because for open-ended funds, this is also important to have enough liquidity. So how do you suspend redemption and how this will impact your dividend in the end and the valuation at the end of the day. Well, broadly, like the question now is how this should be applied into the valuation. The valuation methodology will be changed only if there is evidence in the changes in the characteristic of the assets or the market being performed. And I mean, as we know, well, now currently Europe is badly affected by the conflict and the war in Ukraine. 
So, like in terms of evaluation, what happens? Like the evaluation will be changed, as I mentioned, only when we have the evidence that the market is stressed. When we'll say that we have to change the basis of value, we have to change the premises of value, and we have to assess, I mean, at the asset level, if the asset is performing, like going concern or non going concern. If after these things you'll see that there is very heavily evidence that there is a lack of liquidity, that the market is stressed, that the asset is not performing, in this case you'll change the methodology. If there is not enough evidence or where you consider that the asset is performing, so there is no need to do this. The point of ESMA and CSSF following is very straightforward. You do a liquidity stress testing, but make sure that you apply this into the valuation and if there is evidence that the market is illiquid, you, you you adapt it into your evaluation analysis. So, thanks for that. And yeah, noting also what, what you said about liquidity in terms of assets, but also liquidity at, at fund level. Uh, that's also important also, and also something mentioned by the CSSF in their, in their feedback report, also the implementation of uh, yeah, liquidity management uh, tools uh, at, uh, at some point. And when we talk about less liquidity, so at asset level, at fund level, but more generally speaking, also at, let's say, private market level. Uh, and so we have seen less transactions, less uh, exits uh, across almost all strategies, P, real estate, uh, infrastructure, uh, venture capital, of course, and maybe the, this, uh, this last one is probably one of the most impacted strategy with less also uh, funding round. I think that for that, we have maybe a, a slide three that maybe we can we can share on the on the screen where we'll see that in terms of uh, uh, deal count but also deal value there was also a um, uh, decrease decreasing trend over the past two years maybe on on this one Irina do you want to to say a few words just see how it can impact uh, also the valuation methodologies you select but also the the value of the assets itself. Yes, sure. Uh, thank you for the question. It's slide three, please. Yes, so uh, effectively we see um, the decrease in, in the value of, um, not only in the value, actually we see the decrease in the deal count, uh, both in the US and the European markets. Uh, and also deal value uh, across PE and VC. Although if you go into details of pitch book report on that, you will see that actually um, some uh, subsectors of VC, they uh, didn't suffer that much uh, from this um, deal value decrease, actually uh, precede seed and late venture capital even increased in the value of pre-money variation at least. But of course, overall, we see the strand of decreased number of transactions and uh, of um, decreased uh, valuations. And of course, the, the number of, or like uh, rather the percentage of um, down rounds also increased and that makes um, investors' uh, decisions about the valuation and our work a bit uh, more complicated because we need to reflect those down rounds into, in the valuation, of course. Well, these are two trends. Uh, there was a hype in 2021, excess liquidity, um, some so-called tourist investors in the VC sectors because it was super attractive back then and some um, investors that normally never invested in VC uh, were really um, tempted to, to come and invest and get this um, high returns and high capitalization or high valuation. Um, now that markets turned, uh, those investors walked away and we see a correction. Also, it's in terms of fundamental value, especially in some sectors like blockchain, um, some fintech. For example, there were uh, very high prices for buy now pay later companies um, concept but they haven't proved to uh, manage to become uh, profitable within uh, several years uh, therefore investors also started losing uh, faith and uh, interest and even if the company is performing quite well and according to the plan we see down rounds there
So these are two trends in the market. There are some corrections and also from the perspective of the company's performance, there are some corrections um, towards optimization, of course, inflation, as it was already mentioned, also affected um, demand uh, in some sectors. And of course, this all led to um, the uh, trend that you see. In terms of valuation methodologies, now we focus more on calibration because it's more challenging to um, adjust the value from some remote round to the valuation date now because you need to take into account uh, both market movements, which is not straightforward and clear sometimes. Also, uh, the company's performance and uh, more importantly, you need somehow to incorporate that into valuation so that it really uh, reflects the true value of the assets. Uh, for VC, it's more milestone analysis uh, because, again, it helps to understand if a company should be revalued up, down, or, or just keep at cost uh, since the last round and also how uh, down rounds can be reflected uh, for the value of um, less senior stocks, let's say that were issued before. So for example, the fund holds uh, some, some B shares and then C shares were issued at a lower price. What happens to, to B shares? Let's say, are they the same price or not really? So how their value should be also adjusted. So this all comes down to um, car calibration exercises, which might be super sophisticated at times, but at the end of the day, um, all those quantitative and qualitative methods and analysis should uh, boil down to a simple idea if the value makes sense from the overall perspective of the market and performance uh, since uh, the transaction, since we really had a like really reliable evidence of the price for this company. Yes. So well, what I understand is that there were so changes on on the inputs, uh, so and we discuss about uh, interest rates, about uh, ERP. We discuss also about less liquidity, so private uh, in terms of for the assets, for the funds, uh, also for private market, generally speaking. And on top of that, we have also, let's say, this geopolitical environment, uh, and just maybe just to list a few of them. So, of course, situation uh, in, in uh, Russia uh, slash Ukraine, Situation in the Middle East, the Suez Canal, situation also in, for, for NATO, China, Taiwan, North Korea, coming Euro European election, also the US presidential election in November. So that, that's a nice list. Uh, so a lot of events may result in surprises or potentially also stress market conditions. And I'm, uh, for this one, maybe I'm, I'm looking at you, Raphael, um, uh, because it's also a point to to consider as per the CSF feedback report to so these stress market conditions or potential uh, 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 stress market condition scenarios, how should the valuation policy and procedures, and maybe also the selection of the valuation methodologies be adapted to this potential risk? And here we are talking potentially about short-term risk. Right, thank you. That, 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 that's a very interesting question again. Uh... Antoine, I, I try to be brief because I think we are we are uh, we are we, we are short on time. Um, so uh, uh, these geopolitical events have uh, have an influence on how the valuation uh, is uh, the values of the different assets. Certainly, um, I mean the fact that the markets change uh, strongly may have an effect on how the methodology that, you're, that will be used for uh, for valuation. Um, Think that uh, that in particular, I mean, uh, transaction multiples, if they are from 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 earlier years, may uh, not be as relevant as they are in the current market conditions. Also, uh, trading comparables may not be as reliable because we all know that private markets tend to have some time to adapt to the valuations. So these are very relevant matters. How to define trend market conditions? I mean, that that's an interesting point, either exhaustively. Or, or not, um, what we see, I mean, well, some some um, some market players are using it in terms of how much an index, a relevant index will move, could be S&P 500, could be MSCI World Index, uh, how much the VIX could use, which is a volatility index that comes from the option markets. Uh, now VIX, for example, is back more or less to pre-COVID levels. 
but uh, during a very long time it moved to the 15 to 20 that where it was to more than uh, to more than 60 for covid and and, and was at uh, more than 30 level during long time so now we're we i mean this is part of of what we see as a certain level of stabilization but a lot of uncertainty about, about what's going to happen as you as you mentioned and um, many asset managers have learned from their COVID experience from the start of the war in Ukraine to say, well, it would be preferable to have something in place so we can adapt and we can steer if we see the market are, are moving. Uh, as I think th they learned from the experience not having incorporated this in uh, of true COVID times. Thank, thanks for that. Uh, and uh, so in, indeed, we are we are also uh, so noting this changes in regulation, so standard, but also regulatory framework, so changing uh, world also in terms of market conditions. So of course, the two together should, I would not say force, but probably kindly invite also the profession, the valuation profession to adapt its valuation practices. And you see where I'm coming from, also switching to the last uh, section of this, uh, of this panel, of this uh, webinar uh, today, and also considering, also the, considering the time constraints. Uh, and maybe one of the, when we prepared that, uh, that webinar together, uh, one of them was uh, in terms of valuation, evolution of valuation practices. The focus from regulators or standards on market-oriented valuation approaches this is not something new, but this is something that we see more, more and more. And maybe for, for this one, I think that we have also this, um, this last slide for today, so slide five. Uh, and and for this for this question, maybe I'm I'm looking also at, at you, Irina. Um, so market multiples, transaction multiples, or so valuation approach that is also more market oriented. And at the same point in time, we are talking about stress market situation, market dislocation. There are also less recent market transaction. If we if we look at the slides also over the past quarters, less exits, less financing rounds. Uh, and as you as you mentioned it also, Raphael, some equity indices, for instance, in the in the US, are more and more concentrated. So the Magnificent Seven, for instance. So when we say that we should still focus on even more focus on market approach rather than income approach, actually, that that it still makes sense. Um, well, I would uh, comment um, from a practitioner's perspective. Uh, well. We normally focus on the approaches which um, are based on the most reliable and available data. So we are looking at the markets now and try to understand if they are reliable and uh, what data we have available. So of course, if you don't have data points, it's difficult to draw any conclusion, but it's not actually that bad. And although markets uh, are volatile and hardly predictable, but still they give us a really good basis for the analysis. And honestly, I, I wouldn't focus always on some specific method and uh, say that market approach is the best uh, method ever for any case and situation. On, this, on the other hand, you can't say that you can ignore it. So. I would say if you want a comprehensive approach to the value, you need to look uh, at cash flows uh, from the income approach perspective, at multiples uh, from the market perspective, and also you need to understand and reconcile um, the value from the last round of transaction for, for the investment to the valuation date from the perspective of uh, performance of the company and the market performance. Like just to wrap it up quickly, I, I should say that uh, markets still gives us a lot of information on the on the valuation, and without this analysis, I I, I don't see uh, the value to be really supported. On the other hand, of course, uh, now that we have fewer data points, we need to look at other methods too. And uh, yeah, based on that, I think that you can mitigate indeed this this valuation risk. When we talk about valuation risk, and it was also probably another evolution of, of the valuation practice, it's the retailization of private markets. Uh, and uh, with also more and more alternative investment strategies open to retail uh, investors. So also it's a, a point for the regulator just to make sure that the investors are protected, uh, also in terms of uh, defined redemption time frame, minimum liquidity buffer. Uh, but from a valuation standpoint, it 
generally result in a higher NAV frequency on increased valuation cadence. Uh, and maybe for, for this one, Daniele, uh, for, for you, do you see any change or impact on, um, generally speaking, valuation process, valuation governance, or valuation risk for the valuation practitioner? Um, well, indeed, uh, we see um, a growing attention also in case of open-ended funds. Uh, um, and I think, you know, the impact uh, is uh, substantial and it's more or less the common denominator of everything we've been saying today, you know, when it comes to having a, a strong valuation policy and, you know, a framework where the valuation could be reconciled from one valuation date to the other valuation date. In my opinion, what is very important is the consistency. So you would need to be able as a value to justify and challenge changes in market, let's say assumptions, but also in our, in the target company subject to, to the valuation, which in theory is uh, uh, extremely easy, but in practice it is not. Also because we always do our valuation on an ex post basis. So it's always uh, difficult to try to uh, isolate the information which were not applicable as at the valuation date. On the other side, we have a, a problem with the, the data potentially, which might not be available as at evaluation date. So I think this is, uh, mm, this is making the entire evaluation process more, 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 more relevant, I would say. And also this should be linked to one of the topics that we were also discussing earlier, no, in relation to the IPF guidelines, uh, which were published last year. What's the information known or knowable as at the evaluation date? Um, that's also, that's also a key point saying that the company has, uh, uh, let's say won a new client, uh, in, uh, in, uh, for example, July, it's an information that you would probably have when you do the valuation as at the 30th of June, but would it be reflected by a generic market participant buying the company as a June? Probably, probably if this was not known, uh, this should be uh, not reflected. And this clearly creates volatility in the NAV computation. So that's really to be handled with, with care, from my opinion. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe also considering uh, uh, timing and Rafael, if you want to quickly complement that. Uh, certainly, most certainly. So I think that one, one of the key items here that we need to consider is um, that when you have a, on the traditional close-ended funds, most of the valuation risk was perceived at the end. So basically when, the, when there was an exit and the fear of the investors was more about being having an overvaluation. Um, the, the complexity of an open-ended fund uh, is much larger in that regard because when you have different NAV dates, it being the monthly, quarterly, where you have possible exits of rent of investors, uh, the risk of a breach of fiduciary duty in terms with, with your valuation risk is much higher. Uh, why? Because if you have a non-devaluation, you are allowing investors to enter at a lower price to the detriment of your current investors. If you have a, a, an overvaluation, uh, you will have the problem that some investors may exit and uh, to the detriment to the investors that stay. Okay, so uh, that's why uh, with this retailization, with the, the 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 certain certain players being interested in entering in private markets, which have much longer period holdings uh, than than other retail markets, um, the the regulators are uh, vigilant about what's to happen and that everything is in place to allow swiftly. Uh, for retail investors to enter, and that's why we see from uh, SEC uh, entering into this, uh, entering into this debate, as well as ESMA and uh, national competent authorities in Europe discussing these this matters. You're right that ultimately what should be done should be done also to respect the re regulatory framework, but also in the best interest also of the of the investors. Maybe Christophe on on this one, any anything to to add? So. Uh, Yes, it, it's probably also one of the topics that uh, we want to discuss. It's about uh, the technology and, and so forth. Um, uh, I think I, I would like to mention technology uh, hand in hand with uh, uh, talent. Uh, so um, uh, so it, uh, increased frequency, um, open-ended re re retailization and so forth. Well, you need more and more valuations. So there is a, it's good to have technology. But you also need 
well-trained professionals to be able to, uh, to, to operate such technology, basically. Yeah? So um, I, I think, uh, yes, we need to, as a profession, we need to embrace uh, that uh, technological evolution because that will help uh, addressing the investor demand of having uh, m more frequent valuations or other stakeholders demand having more frequent uh, valuations. And uh, at the same time, it would be, uh, yeah, um, I would say risky uh, to put, uh, to, to just consider that technology can do the whole job. And therefore, uh, as an, uh, and that's also a little bit the duty of the LVPA, uh, it's to, to make sure that uh, we, we make sure that the, that the overall level and the training uh, of the profession is there so that we can have more uh, trained professionals as well that can uh, use those uh, advanced tools. So I think it's a, it's a welcomed evolution. There is a challenge. And uh, yeah, I think if, if we can manage both at the same time, it would be, uh, it would be enabling the, the addressing of such, uh, such demand. Thank you. Thank you, Christophe. And uh, indeed, I think that yeah, the evolution of valuation, valuation platforms or non spreadsheet somewhere, softwares is also something important. And we, yeah, something that we are noting also in terms of evolution for the valuation practice. Uh, maybe, Elena, is that also something that, that, you have, uh, that you have noted? Yeah, I think it's something which is coming, you know, like technologies, I mean, it's taking everything, right? And valuation is not something which is an exclusion, right? So we definitely currently we have uh, like technology implied into the valuation analysis and it's quite an advanced stage for certain asset classes like real estate. If we take, we have Argus, which I think it's practically performing the valuation work of an appraisal. Uh, also, I think for the private debt, we are quite advanced. For example, Crawl also provides a platform for valuing private debt. There are other valuation providers like with, with technology involved, like, the, like Valutico 73 strings, and they are all into an evolving stage because when you do a demo with them, you see like from first time to the second, the next round that they evolve which is normal because technology is something which will evolve. Like if you allow me, I can make an analogy because people are wondering, will the valuation profession disappear? I think no, right? Because like if you take like as an analogy, as I was saying, the watch industry, right? You have like an eye watch, I have a quartz, somebody will have a mechanical watch, right? And it's because of a you want to be practical, you want to count your steps from <laughs> one room to another. I want to something quick, which is convenient for me. And there are like connoisseurs who admire the mechanics of watch, right? Because it's something which is taking all the stages, right? And the market is for everybody. Same for the valuation models. I mean, we will have automated, and we have already automated valuation models. We have technology, but we still need valuation professionals who will be able to judge and to be able to say an opinion. For example, I know a company, a startup, which is evolving, they will provide the technology for valuation for free. The question will be that their cash flow will come from the interpretation of evaluation, which is the most challenging for certain clients in a way that, okay, you have a tool, it's available for free, it did my valuation model, but is this result the right one? Is it reliable? Also, another point from the IVS for new standards, because as I mentioned already, we have a new chapter on the IVS, like on the uh, uh, like valuation models, and where in the standard is written that an like an automated valuation model, it's not like something which is a valuation model. It has you need a valuation professional to be involved to be considered as a valuation model. So it's something which is evolving and we'll see what happens next, but valuation profession is still needed. I think. Well, good, good news then. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, I'm back to uh, the point also from, uh, from Christophe about uh, the, just to make sure that there's this uh, uh, valuation competence and especially here in Luxembourg, and it's also one of the mission of the, of the LVPA, because even if we have new tools, I think it's important also to have someone on the other side of the tools to understand uh, them. 
Um, I thank you, Elena, as well for the, the analogy to the, to the watch. I think it's, uh, it's what you have an eye watch. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, high time, probably, also to uh, to close this uh, this uh, this panel. Maybe we, we said um, uh, maybe just uh, for for a Q and A session. Maybe just uh, we we wanted to wrap up everything at uh, uh, let's say fifteen past past twelve. So. Uh, maybe we have time for one, one or two questions. Uh, so maybe we can we can quickly uh, uh, look at that. Uh, so if you have questions in the in the chat, maybe we can we can take a couple of uh, a couple of them. Maybe if we can if we can see them on the on the screen would be uh, would be great. Okay, maybe. If we, if we cannot see them on the, or, or we can take them separately. Yeah, separately. The and so, in in that case, what I suggest, maybe in the in the interest of time, if uh, so, we will we will look at the the question in in the chat and we'll uh, we will uh, reply to them also separately after this uh, this webinar. So, in uh, in that case, but I uh, I hope that it was uh, useful uh, for uh, for you if you uh, uh, attended this uh, this webinar. I will uh, say a big thank you to the five uh, panelists here. Uh, at least it was insightful for for me. It answered some questions. Probably it created new ones as well. But maybe it could be for for another webinar. Uh, thank you also PwC for welcoming us in that uh, large uh, uh, auditorium, and also to the PwC technical team. Um, thank you the LPA for setting up uh, this event, and in particular the Invent teams. Uh, so. Uh, Yuan, Evi, and, uh, and Joanna, thank you for that. Thank you also the LVPA for the co-organization. Uh, of course, if you are interested in more valuation-related session, please, uh, I would encourage you to apply as an uh, individual member to the, uh, to the LV LVPA. You will find all the details on the, on the website of the association. Uh, and I'm uh, really looking forward to the, to the next one. So, uh, Thank you, everyone. Thanks for uh, for your time. Thanks for uh, watching, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, thank and you. thank you, Antoine, as well. <laughs> thank you, Antoine. <laughs>